of culture, society, and economy link the Northern Kingdom <laughs> with the Israelites of the Iron One period. Did you guys come up with something to say about this? I hope. This is too bright. You were supposed to think about this and be ready for it. Lindsay, tell me something. The cult sites are separate from the living space. That is right. That is the same. What else? Yes, they're, they're literate, and the language is the same, and the alphabet is the same. Mm -hmm. They're literate, and their religious practices are the same. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't have a lot of evidence that Israelite iron one masonry skills were anything to write. They didn't do those ashlar blocks. They, they built with field stones. So they didn't have uh, monumental construction. They didn't have administrative structures or big storerooms. They didn't have large engineering projects. They didn't have fortifications. They didn't have imported goods. So there really isn't anything else that they have in common, uh, except, of course, for the one thing that uh, should be, according to the, the biblical text, the key thing, which is religious praxis. Praxis meaning how things were practiced, that, that the religious cult sites were high places, that they were separate from um, settlement places. Obviously, in the Iron II period, people lived, people lived at Don, people lived at Bethel, but uh, these were not, and quite deliberately not, religious centers. So. With which other culture is the Northern Kingdom, Iron II Israel, most similar? All those other points that I just made. What other culture had all of those features? This is an easy question. Akella. Uh, yeah, well, we've, what, where we've really seen it is in Canaanite land. And what aspects the Philistines had, they pick up when, when they get there. So international luxury goods. This is late Bronze Age Megiddo. This is Iron II Samaria. Monumental gateways, uh, the script, um, palatial, and... Uh, and administrative compounds, oops, palatial administrative compounds, like this at Chatzor. So in that uh, economic, political, and social aspects of their world, the northern kingdom of Israel carries on many of the features that were part of the landscape of this exact region in the preceding era. The most significant difference between Canaanite urban culture of the Bronze Age and Israelite culture of the Northern Kingdom in Iron II? We're just circling back around here. In what way? Yeah. So in the Canaanite milieu, cult was part and parcel of the state 
apparatus. That's what the archaeological remains tell us very clearly. Here is the Citadel Temple at Hatsor, which certainly was next to, on the Acropolis of um, Hatsor, next to the palace, which was also up there. And uh, here's that, that knife handle from Megiddo with this um, important personage sitting in this throne. So this amalgamation of, in modern parlance, church and state, God and king, was a constituent feature of the Canaanite world and was the single most significant difference between the landscape of the northern kingdom of Israel and the Canaanite world of its predecessors. The small kingdoms founded in the wake of the dissolution of the United Monarchy, the divided monarchies of Israel and Judah in the 9th centuries and the early 8th centuries, were at the fringe of two competing empires. One was the empire of Egypt at this exact point in time, the 8th century now, in turmoil and abeyance without a single strong pharaonic head. But this region was at the far western edge of the growing military and political power of the Assyrian Empire. In this map you see the heartland of Assyria, modern day northern Iraq, the upper reaches between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers up to the Zagros Mountains and the Iranian Plateau. And in, uh, at the end of the ninth century, that, that empire, that kingdom was contained within this territory. But a series of strong, very militarily aggressive rulers expanded methodically and systematically the borders of the Assyrian Empire in a clear interest in getting to the sea, getting to the Mediterranean. So over the course of the ninth century, the small kingdoms of Nor of Syria, northern Syria, from Carchemish to Damascus, around Damascus, the kingdom against whom the citadel at Hatsor had been, had been built, um, were absorbed into the Assyrian kingdom. And in the middle of the ninth century, in 841, the king Shalmaneser III makes it uh, the cities of Phoenicia and, the, and uh, to the northern kingdom of Israel, where in this magnificent, solid, stone monument, a black um, obelisk-shaped uh, four-sided pillar, there are reliefs and inscriptions explaining uh, that Shalmaneser uh, conquered the five different kingdoms, one of which was the House of Israel. And he received tribute from, from Yao. There's uh, some disagreement about precisely which of the um, Israel light, is kings, of, kings of Israel this is. Usually it's, he's identified with Yehu, J-E-H-U. Um, He's called here the son of Omri. That's one of the problems with identifying him as Jehu because Jehu um, is not actually part of the family of Omri. He was a usurper who killed uh, the current king in order to take over. But he could be here be, being called son of Omri as in son of the house of Omri, um, Omri being the monarch who is most credited with establishing the northern kingdom because he's the person who built the capital city at Samaria in the same way that we have Beit David in the Aramaic inscription from Don, House of David, is, you might think of this as the House of Omri. Where was so, found? It's found at Nimrod, right there, in the ruins of the palace at Nimrod. So, um, so you see here uh, Yao, which may be Yehu, son of Omri, bowing before Shalmaneser, 
and his, and his uh, officials and his priests. Um, this, he's wearing the king and he has, uh, he's wearing the crown and he has the longest beard and the longest robe. So it's one of the ways that you could tell that he's the king. And he, he Shalmaneser, receives all this, this tribute as is described here. Um, so, so in the middle of the ninth century, Shalmaneser turns Israel into a tributary state. But uh, shortly thereafter, uh, his successor, Sargon II, uh, conquers and completely destroys the northern kingdom, uh, uh, an event which is recorded on this cuneiform um, prism, these, these, minu- these objects from the Neo-Syrian uh, houses are, are prismatic clay or stone objects on which the royal annals of the kings are recorded. And there are several copies of the, of the royal annals of Sargon II, um, which were also found at Nimrud. And you see a section from this one here where Sargon says, at the beginning of my royal rule, the town of the Samaritans I conquered, I led away as prisoners 27,290 inhabitants and equipped from among them soldiers to man 50 chariots of my royal corps. And this is an event which is recorded also in the book of Second Kings, 17 Five, the king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, laid siege to it. And in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. And with this conquest, the northern kingdom of Israel disappears from the stage of history. And its constituent population is scattered. Some is left, not every last man, woman, and child is carted off, but certainly significant numbers of people are dispersed. Because there had been in the initial divide 10 tribes that had followed Jeroboam in the split, these are the famous, infamous 10 lost tribes of the Israelites. This is what happens to them. They are deported and resettled in um, essentially a region that we now know today as Kurdistan. And with that event in the latter part of the 8th century, the northern kingdom of Israel disappears and there are only two solvent political entities left the southern kingdom of Judah and the various fortified city-states of Philistia. Judah is a kingdom in the sense that there is a single person in charge of a larger area. And this region, Philistia, is more or less a coalition of like-minded, similarly um, derived (laughs) folks speaking the same language, having the same customs, but each with uh, a city independent from, from the next. Why weren't Judah and Philistia swept up in the conquests of Sargon? For a very simple reason. They were further south, and the Assyrians just hadn't gotten to them yet. But with the dispersal of the population of the northern kingdom and actually with the imminent threat of the Assyrian attack prior, lots of folks from the kingdom of Israel clearly moved south, moved into the regions of Philistia and Judah. And the population of Judah after the fall of Samaria and the northern kingdom grows enormously. We have a fair amount of archaeological evidence about Judah and especially its capital, Jerusalem, after the conquest of Israel and less from the period prior, which is one of the reasons that I've waited until now to start talking about about Judah. So let's have a brief moment of uh, 
catch up with an examination of the capital city of Judah, Jerusalem. And you have a topographic plan in front of you, I hope. Did everybody get a handout? Jerusalem was a city settled early on because it has several strategic and topographic advantages. Like all great cities, all the great cities of the world, all the cities that are very long lived, all the cities that today we think of as sort of key, fundamental, long lived spots, London and Paris and Rome and Istanbul, Constantinople, and Athens. These are all places with very, very um, privileged geographic, topographic, strategic points and advantages. That's, that's what has made them attractive to people for, for millennia. And Jerusalem is like that too. Jerusalem has a number of key advantages. So Jerusalem, first of all, has a constant, very abundant source of good natural water in a spring called the Gihon Spring, which I think is on your plan. Yes, it is. Um, and, is and is located right about there um, at the bottom of this long natural spur. So the Gihon Spring still today provides enough uh, water constantly to uh, allow all of the fields and of the, of the folks who live in this area, all the fields in this valley and on these slopes, to, to be watered. Since Jerusalem itself is just slightly below the most advantageous amount of rainfall for constant, the ability to dry farm constantly, as for example in Samaria, the presence of a natural, constantly flowing spring is pretty critical. Jerusalem is um, located at the height of the southern part of the Central Hills. From there, everything goes down in all directions. So it's a very strategic spot. And if you remember from your topographic maps that I handed out originally, it is immediately along that spine of the crest of the Central Hills. From Jerusalem, there are natural valleys leading directly eastward to the Jordan River and westward to the Mediterranean. So it's very well situated for both north-south and east-west communication and traffic. And Jerusalem is a naturally strategic spot because a series of deep valleys crisscross forming, framing uh, a few protected plateaus that allow for safer, more secure settlement. So one of these deep valleys, the one that runs to the east of the city, is the Kidron. And here you see the Kidron in an aerial view. And then a valley that intersects at right angles, more or less, with the Kidron is the Hinnom, which is down here. And then there is a third valley, which is a little harder to see now because it's been filled in over the millennia, but this is a, this is a deep natural valley that, that isolates the western edge of this spur and the western edge of this plateau. And this deep valley is called the Tyropian Valley. And all, all of these are on, your, on the plan that I handed out to you. The only place where there is not a natural valley protecting an elevated section of the city of Jerusalem is the north. In the north, there is a, a, a large flat area, which is why throughout every phase of its history, from the Iron Age 
through the Roman conquest of Titus to British conquest in World War I to the Israeli conquest in 1967, a successful attack of Jerusalem has always come from the north. Because that's the only area that's not naturally protected by a valley. This particular spur, this plateau here with this spur, is the most advantageous spot in the city because there is this large high point on which it's most convenient to build. And then there is this naturally protected spur coming down from it. And it is at the bottom of this spur that the Gihon Spring is located. And it is therefore this spur, which you see here, which is the zone where archaeological evidence shows the earliest evidence for life in the city of Jerusalem. This spur is called the City of David, um, although David's not around when settlement first begins here. Settlement is first attested here in the early Bronze Age in the third millennium BC with houses at the, at the lower end of the eastern slope of the City of David. And the city is first fortified, Jerusalem, the City of David is first fortified in the Middle Bronze Age, in the Canaanite period, with a monumental fortification wall. And you see this um, is a picture that I took, um, at, not as, as opposed to this one, which I, which I got. Um, and this shows houses on the lower slope of the city of David uh, right about here. And it is in this area that uh, excavation has found this Middle Bronze Age rampart, which partially covered um, some of the early Bronze Age construction. So, so Jerusalem was a large fortified Canaanite city in the Bronze Age, like a lot of other large fortified Canaanite cities. In the late Bronze Age, in the period of Renepta, Jerusalem was important enough of a place to have a king who wrote, like many other Canaanite kings in, this, in the late Bronze Age, agitated letters to uh, the, the pharaoh Akhenaten IV, Tutankhamun, the, um, the famous Amarna letters. There are six Amarna letters from the king of Jerusalem, King Abdi Hepa <laughs> of Jerusalem, to, uh, to, the, to the Egyptian royal house at Amarna. And I just have Merneptah's campaign map on here to remind you of when we were obsessing about this period <laughs> a few weeks ago. Uh, so here's Jerusalem, which apparently was not a, a target of Merneptah, obviously. Anyway, he doesn't take any credit for it, um, uh, but, was, uh, but was a large and settled city. This is the city that, according to uh, the biblical book, Second Samuel, was eyed by David when he had been king for about six years or so uh, of the Israelites and ruling from the town of Hebron in uh, the southern Judean hills. Um, Jerusalem was uh, a fortified city, according to the book of 2 Samuel, which David and his small but valiant cohort conquers, in part by um, letting themselves in through a water shaft, through a water system. And uh, then, according to 2 Samuel 5, 9, um, uh, after his successful conquest, he establishes here in this area of the city um, his capital, which he then calls, he names after himself, the city of David. And from that point on, this, that is the name that this sector of the city has, has held. We sure would like to have some archaeological remains to go with the time of David. And this is one of the most hotly contested topics in the archaeology of Jerusalem itself, one of the most pertinent topics in the archaeology of Israel. There's precious little to go on. There is one very um, uh, inviting target for connecting David with Jerusalem. 
And that is this structure here, which was excavated first by Kathleen Kenyon and later by Yigal Shilo in um, this part of the city of David on the slope. So we're on the, on the, on the slope here of, of the city. In, uh, and air, all the areas of the city of David excavations have letters to go along with their names. And this particular excavation area is area G. So in the area of area G, there's this monumental thing, uh, which you see here in closer view. And uh, let's see, here's a person, here's a person, and here's a person. So that gives you some better sense of scale for how gigantic this is. It is um, wholly made out of stones, and it's stepped, and it seems to be something structural, and so it's called the step stone structure, which you, <laughs> which you can abbreviate in your notes, SSS, step stone structure. Gigantic, uh, 58 courses, 17 meters high, preserved, probably, but keeps on going. The, the bottom of it hasn't been, th this area hasn't been excavated, so the bottom of it isn't known. And the top of it was sheared away by later construction. So uh, it has, is estimated to have been about 30 meters high in toto. Its um, northern and southern boundaries are unknown because, again, parts of it were removed for later construction. So these, for example, are later houses that were built terraced into the stepstone structure. So parts of it were dismantled. The whole thing seems to have been built at once. That is where parts were removed for excavation, such as down here. You can see that there are a series of very, very deep cross walls that are then filled in by um, by stones going, making a kind of checkerboard. So it's one monumental construction. Below it is late Bronze Age remains. So it's later than the late Bronze Age. Built into it are ninth century houses. So it's earlier than the ninth century. That leaves a little bit of time. This is a little like the problem of the um, iron one mud brick wall at Chatzor. There's more time to a lot to this than you'd like to be able to pin it down. It's not provable that the stepstone structure is iron one, iron two A, David, Solomon, or even Rehoboam, latter part of the 10th century. Uh, but it is the only candidate for monumental construction that could possibly be associated with uh, the early establishment of Jerusalem as a capital under either David or Solomon. So there's been a um, tremendous amount of discussion. And I tell you all of this because even though I give you lots of stuff to read and I hope to prevent you from trolling about in strange websites, um, looking for <laughs> wacky theories, that, which are very easy for you to come across. I suspect that some of you will do that anyway. And so I just warn you that anything that you read about Jerusalem in the time of David, the stepstone structure, um, and, and so on, will be somebody's opinion, but by no means provable, demonstrable fact. So the pendulum of interpretation for this has swung wildly back and forth. Everything from this was a construction built by the last Jebusite kings of Jerusalem in preparation for the growing Israelite threat. Completely possible. Archaeologically, you can't say it's not. To this is a construction of Rehoboam after uh, his father Solomon had built the temple. He then increased the fortifications of the city. And there is, in fact, nothing to associate uh, the biblically attested David and Solomon with any monumental establishment or construction in Jerusalem. That's another extreme. Two, this is an, uh, a construction that is actually attested in the Bible, in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, where David says that he conquered the city and took the Hebrew word, Milo, 
a word that appears only once in the Bible and here, and so nobody knows what it means. Because usually you need a few contexts for words to be able to tell what they mean, and this is the only time that this word appears. So uh, nobody knows what the Milo is, but it, from, the, from the way that it's referred to, it seems like it ought to be some large monumental construction. And this is the only thing that could possibly fit the bill. So a lot of people identify this as the Milo of, of David, that is the, the fortification um, that he that that was that formed part of part of the city of David. Um, any interpretation of the historicity of David's conquest and his gathering in and building up of Jerusalem as the as the center of Judah rests on uh, what little we can tell about other archaeological um, trends in the 10th century in Judah. And uh, this has, this is complicated because a lot of those iron one, those new iron one settlements that were part of our identification of the Israelites in the first place in the Central Hills. So this is the part of the map that you saw, uh, part of the chart that you saw back when we were talking about Iron One and the Israelites, and this is, that, uh, this is that map. Something very weird happens to this settlement pattern uh, in the Iron Two period. What happens is that uh, a lot of these Iron One settlements are abandoned. A lot of these little Iron One settlements are abandoned, and new settlements take their place. Now this is data derived from survey, and so we don't really know that much about the extent of most of these settlements. Settlements, like it moves somewhere else? Yeah. They move down top, somebody else moves down top. No, it moves. Okay. It moves somewhere else. So, uh, so you can see, for example, um, a lot of these little circles, which are iron one, Disappear. I mean, they, they're not. They don't are not re-inhabited in in Iron Two. Um, so uh, so th it becomes complicated to assert that uh, the biblical tradition of David having brought everybody together and mobilized all of his forces and founded some major kingdom. Um, is not clearly borne out by the survey data. Although survey data is, is difficult to interpret in, in and of itself, what we would really like our excavations is some of these new Iron 2A sites. Um, and that is where this site, uh, Kirbit Kayefa, comes in. And I told you about this site briefly a few weeks ago. But this is actually the spot in um, in the history where it, per, it shows up. Because here at Kayafa is one of these new Iron 2A sites uh, that's now being excavated. And it's located, very interestingly, uh, on the edge of the highlands of Judah. Almost exactly opposite, uh, on, on one height, and then there's an intervening valley, and then the valley on the other side has a big Philistine city on it, Tel Safi, which is probably Gath, Gath of the Philistines. And here at Kayafa uh, is a fortified site. There's a casemate wall. There's a gate. There's some sort of large building on the inside of the gate. And this is the place from which this ostracon, uh, the text of which has not yet been published, but which has the word slave and king and, um, legible on it, apparently, was found. So, so here is one of these new fortified sites in Iron 2A. And the fact that it's on the outskirts of the highlands of Judah is very interesting for those who would like to assert that at this time, say around 1,000, 
first, first third of the 10th century BC, that is the time of David, um, there was an organized polity with its center at Jerusalem, and that organized polity had enough wherewithal to be able to fortify <laughs> sites on its, on its perimeter. Um, Kirbek Hayafa mysteriously is abandoned at the end of Iron 2A. By the latter part of the 10th century, nobody is living here anymore. It's a one period, one period fortified site. All right, back to Jerusalem. Um, so other evidence for 10th century um, construction in Jerusalem, highly desirable, practically uh, non-existent. Uh, and the reasons are not, so there, there are two possible, well, there's one certain reason, and then there's one possible explanation. Um, the one certain reason is that Jerusalem has been continuously inhabited, continuously built up, and the specific area of the city of David in the area where there would have been 10th century remains as is most impressively built up. So, so here is that uh, plateau at the northern end of the city of David. This is the Temple Mount on, on which today is the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa. And the connection between the Temple Mount and the city of David is a wide, uh, pretty gentle sloped area. And that wide, gentle sloped area, which you see here, is called the Ophel. Yes, there is a city there now. Here it is. Um, but there are excavations, both areas where nobody is allowed to live, and it's all excavated area, like this area south of the Temple Mount, for example. And then there are spots within ha inhabited areas. So Area G in the city of David is in between people's houses. And all of the other areas um, in the city of David are in between people's houses. And other areas that have been excavated, like for example, there have been a lot of excavations here in the upper city, which we'll be learning about when we get to the time of Herod the Great. And um, that was because this area was rebuilt after the 1967 war and before there was any building it was one gigantic archaeological excavation for about eight years. And a lot of the buildings there are on uh, like stilts. So that's how they do it. Tom. When we were studying northern southern kingdom, if Jerusalem is a smaller town compared to the northern kingdom, it would seem to contradict that. Well, the question of the size of Jerusalem in this period is exactly to the heart of the arguments about the character of the northern kingdom versus the southern kingdom and the historicity of the biblical narrative. And the problem is that the archaeological evidence is impossible to use in support of a position about the size of Jerusalem. It's also, even if we had specific archaeological evidence about the size of Jerusalem, that's not necessarily going to help us assess its importance or unimportance. Um, because a capital city, I mean, you could only have to compare St. Paul and Minneapolis. St. Paul is the capital. Minneapolis is the bigger city. Um, and here they happen to be connected. But there are many, many states where the largest city is by no means the capital of the state. So a political center doesn't need to be the largest, richest, most expansive to be the most important in terms of the political infrastructure or the social infrastructure of the society. But that said, uh, the effort to locate monumental construction and the accoutrement of a, politi a central political place inscriptions, decorated architecture, luxury goods, monumental tombs in the vicinity, all the things that we have from, from the, the cities of the northern kingdom are few and far between in Jerusalem, in part because, well, in part because the, 
everything's been built up ever since then. I mean, this is all, for example, early Islamic Umayyad period, 11, 9th to 11th century AD CE um, construction, sitting right on top of if there was a palace or large buildings in this area, they're underneath this. You know, they haven't been, been gotten to yet. But maybe the reason that it has, there's not been anything found is because there wasn't very much there. In other words, maybe the reason is that the biblical tradition of the centrality and importance and monumentality of Jerusalem is wildly exaggerated. So depending on, you, you can start from one of those premises and then you can either explain away or explain for the, the little bit of evidence that there is. There is, there is remarkably little from Iron 2A found in Jerusalem. Very little pottery. Uh, there is this, um, there is this fragmentary limestone inscription that was found in the area of the Ophel back in the early part of the 20th century. It's not necessarily Iron 2A. Could be latter part of the 10th century, could be early part of the 9th century, can't be dated precisely. Um, it has been associated with, by people with constructions of Solomon for no uh, reason other than deep desire. Um, it is very fragmentary, broken on all sides, and so it makes no sense. I can tell you what the words there say. Uh, there's a word that says stream, uh, then there's some blanks, mixing of water at the back, far end. It's, it's, very, it's like, huh? <laughs> you, can't, you can't really make any, any sense out of this. But it is a monumental inscription, so it must some sort of injunction about something. And a monumental inscription, that is to say something carved on stone, suggests some central polity. There is also one of these. You may recall these nice capitals from Samaria, Megiddo, Hatzor, one of these um, date palm capitals, so, so this is one of those, that was found just uh, north of Area G, just north of the step zone structure by Kathleen Kenyon and her excavations in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, could be Iron 2A, no. If you would like to associate this with the Palace of Solomon, be my guest. Um, but don't do anything else after that because you've just hypothesized that there's no actual evidence for hooking it up. It's some iron too, nice construction, probably palatial, definitely not precisely datable beyond that. Uh, recently, some of you may have read news reports of uh, a corner of the Palace of King David being found. Um, excavations, let's see, they are um, they're about here. <laughs> In this, in this aerial view by Elat Bazar, um, she found the, uh, a corner of a monumental building um, in a, the edge of a parking lot that then she was allowed to do some excavation in. And some iron two pottery was associated with it. So it looks large. It's um, ashlar blocks and the corners like the citadel at Chatzor. Um, definitely not absolutely 10th century, but could be early could be built on something that, that's early. <coughs> Emily? Uh, yes, yeah, so of course, yeah, the Temple Mount that you're looking at here is from the time of Herod the Great, um, so, the, so you have to imagine not, you have to imagine this away, this wasn't there, um, and there is a smaller, I mean it's still substantial, but a smaller area on top here, and obviously there has been no excavation on the top of the Temple Mount, so we don't have any good evidence for uh, what according to the biblical account, should be there, which is the temple that, um, according to uh, the book of First Kings, Solomon constructed on here. That, I'm about to answer your question in a roundabout way, Emily. That temple, which you see uh, an imagined reconstruction drawing of, this imagined reconstruction drawing is based 
pretty closely on the two chapter long, rather detailed description that is provided in the book of Kings. And when you make a plan of the temple, as described in the book of Kings, it looks very, very much like a single entry monumental temple of Canaanite and North Syrian type. And we have about 40 of these. We've seen a couple in this class. This is the temple from Megiddo. Uh, this is the temple at Hazor. These sorts of temples, which are uh, a, begin to appear in the Middle Bronze Age and are a long-lived type and continue to be built in the Iron Age at the small kingdom cities in North Syria, Sev and several have been found, Aindara, Tel Tayanat, always are accompanied with a palace. There's, these are palace temples. There is always a political and administrative structure next to the temple. And in every case where we have them, the palace is much larger than the temple. The temple is the small building. The palace is the big one. So in answer to your question, where might the palace of Solomon be? And we have, according to the biblical text, um, evidence that whereas the temple was a monumental undertaking, it took seven years and, it, and two whole chapters of, of the Book of Kings, are, or three, are devoted to it. The palace took 13 years to build. So just based on time allotted, one might suppose that the palace was an even more monumental and lavish construction than, than the temple. The Book of Kings does not go into lots of description about the palace, but that doesn't mean anything. So um, yeah, so the Palace of Solomon is, is around here somewhere. Some people would reconstruct the Palace of Solomon as on the Temple Mount. Some people would reconstruct the Palace of Solomon as on the Ophel. Some people would say that it was a continuation of the palace that David would have built in the area of the stepstone structure that was a, a support for that palace in part. And you can say whatever you want, because we have absolutely no physical evidence for it. But um, there definitely was a palace, and uh, it definitely is someplace in the vicinity of the temple, and it was probably larger than the temple, and it was probably something on line with the sorts of palatial compounds that appear in conjunction with these sorts of temples um, at other sites in, in the area. And so, of course, you see it once now what the single most significant structural difference is between the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And what is it? Remember the conversation we had at the beginning of the hour? Yeah. In the Northern Kingdom, the tradition of Israelite worship at separate high places, unconnected with a political center, is continued. In the Southern Kingdom, the Canaanite system of associating worship with the king and centralizing them both in one place continues. So here's an aerial view of Jerusalem looking east toward Jordan. So there is the Temple Mount. And this shadow quite conveniently outlines more or less the city of David. And the Teropian Valley, so the Kidron is on this side, the Hinnom is down here, swings around this way. And the Teropian Valley is this valley, which is barely visible in this aerial view. And then there's another hill west of the Teropian Valley. And so it's called the Western Hill, and it's here. 
The Western Hill actually extends all the way to Mount Zion, which is here, some of you may know about. The Western Hill has no evidence of occupation in the Iron II A period, or indeed in the early part of Iron II B. But beginning in the 8th century, occupation, evidence for occupation shows up here. And that evidence is the most basic kind. Pottery, and you're looking here at some standard issue, iron two pottery from this area. Lamps, jugs, bowls, decanters. And uh, these gals and this little fella. These are figurines. They're called pillar figurines because um, they are, they're a hollow, handmade uh, base that actually could be inserted on the top of a pole. We don't have any evidence that they were, but they're probably hollow because it's better for firing. They don't blow up in the kiln without all that massive clay. And then a mold made head, very similar. And the only other humanoid aspect besides the head are breasts, very large, sometimes exceptionally large. Sometimes it looks like it's hard to know why the girl doesn't fall over. <laughs> and the women, this, these figures are usually displaying their breasts. They're holding them up. These. Uh, gals are very interesting, of course. Um, in a way, these figurines, these, these uh, horses, the horses actually usually have a, a little disc in between their ears, which is sometimes interpreted as a sun disc. These figurines might remind you of um, Phoenician figurines. But they are, they are not identical, and they, are, they, and they emphasize something different. Um, because the, the Judean pillar figurines emphasize not um, pregnancy, not fertility exactly, but in a way, you might conceive of them as, as emphasizing successful pregnancy, because once a woman has had a successful pregnancy, then her breasts are filled with milk, and so they're exceptionally large. And most of these figurines seem to, um, that's, what they, that's the message that they seem to be sending. So there's been a lot of discussion and interest about these Judean pillar figurines. Um, and one of the reasons is that there seems to be a number of places in the Hebrew Bible where various of the Judean kings are um, associated with radical, large-scale attempts to regulate popular religious practice. And one of the ways in which that regulation manifests itself periodically is by getting rid of a female deity who's called Asherah. Asherah sometimes is associated with Yahweh. Sometimes she's associated with trees. Sometimes she's um, associated, so here, for example, there are Asherah poles. And nobody really knows uh, what to, exactly what this means. But the most common suggestion is that from Canaanite times, Asherah, who then was known as Astarte, um, was the consort of Baal or Yahweh. And she was the female power to the male deity on the throne, like Ael and Elat, or Baal and Baalat. And she was part of the religion of the 
people, but not, um, not approved of by the royal house. In support of that notion, um, Kathleen Kenyon and her excavations uh, just north of the Gihon Spring, right about here on the slope of the city of David, found a large cave with over 1,300 um, objects in it. Uh, about 500 of them were figurines. And many of them were broken pillar figurines, bodies and, and, and heads. So one possible explanation for these, these figurines is that they were tossed in here in a kind of large-scale ritual cleansing operation. The date of the appearance of these things is interesting. Uh, I told you they show up um, right around the time that we have an expansion into uh, expansion of people living in Jerusalem into the Western Hill. And that expansion coincides with an influx of people moving in from Samaria, from the, from the Northern Kingdom, because of the incursions of the Assyrians. So folks living up there are moving down into Judah. And so one possible explanation for them, for these figurines, is that um, they are part of a folk religion practiced by the people of the northern kingdom, and they are brought down now to the southern kingdom. But there's a, there is another very um, provocative explanation for them that um, is, is discussed by uh, this by by Ryan Byrne, a scholar um, at a school down in Tennessee. And uh, it is explained in this article that he wrote for, in Near Eastern Archaeology, Lie Back and Think of Judah, the Reproductive Politics of Pillar Figurines. And I have put this on the website um, in the folder marked articles. So you may want, to read, may want to get a hold of this and read it in order to find out uh, more about, about these gals. All right. Um, we will be returning to Jerusalem, but uh, we're going to take a we're going to take a tour break and go down to uh, one city, probably the the most extensively um, excavated and best preserved of the fortified Judean cities, um, for uh, a look at uh, what the kingdom of Judah, what the kings of the kingdom of Judah. Um, promulgated in, in the countryside. And that city is Beersheba, the tell of which you see here, located down here at the southern end of the highlands of Judah, pretty much on the border between the highlands of Judah and the, the Negev Desert. So in the way that um, Chatzor or Gezer were both topographical edges, Beersheba also is a topographical edge. And you may recall the biblical injunction of the, um, or description of the size of the initial kingdom of Israel is from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. So this is that Beersheba. Um, Beersheba was excavated for oh, a long time, over 20 years, by Tel Aviv University, beginning in uh, the late 1960s. And you have this, you have a two-sided handout. Lachish is on one side and Beersheba is on the other. So um, Beersheba was a, a town that was um, settled in the Bronze Age, uh, but it was not a fortified town. It first becomes a fortified town at some point in the 10th century. And it is from the beginning a planned city. So you see here an aerial view of the gate area. There's a four-chambered gate. There's the gate area right here. And, and this planned city has two concentric rings of streets with um, uh, a main cross street bifurcating them. 
The exterior is housed in with a casemate wall. Um, and, ooh, I forgot I was going to talk to you about that. Well, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, a casemate wall. And the casemate wall is very interesting. If you, can, if you look on your plan, you'll see that the casemates, in this case, are the back rooms of the houses. So the wall, the street plan, and the houses were all built together as one planned entity. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's a very nicely laid out town um, with, these, with these houses, with these front rooms, and then these two rooms divided by, by pillars, and then uh, a, a back room. And you, you see uh, one here. They had uh, stone sockles, stone underpinnings, and mud brick superstructures. Doesn't rain too much down here, so that's, that's a pretty reasonable way to excavate. The planning of the town included a monumental water system, which is here in one corner. And you see an aerial view of the way down, 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 down into the water system there. Uh, it's uh, 15 meters down, and when you get all the way down, you enter a series of five interconnected cisterns. 500 cubic meter capacity for the water system. Fantastic. There is a, there's a well, actually, right outside the gate, right here on the plan. Um, and the well does reach all the way down to the natural water table. It's 70 meters deep. But the problem with the well is that it's outside the walls of the city. So the, the, the well is fine if you can leave the city. But if you don't want to have to leave the city, you need one of those monumental water systems on, on the inside. Um, there are a whole uh, series of pillared halls right on the inside of the gate area, as you see on your plan to the right of the gate area when you walk in. And these pillared halls seem to have been used as storerooms, like the ones at Katsur, because in the excavations, and you see they have a higher middle hallway and then lower side rooms. Because in the excavations, they were found filled up with pots. Um, 136 intact vessels were found inside uh, the storerooms. And you see the array. There are um, store jars and, and oil jars and jugs and cooking pots and bowls um, and sort of craters, large, large mixing bowls, dishes, platters, um, smaller jugs and juglets. So, so a wide array of domestic pottery. And they were found in batches. So jars were clumped together, cooking pots were clumped together. Um, wait, before I talk about this, I'll just say one. So, so the city of Beersheba, if you look on your plan, it's all housing. And then there are these storerooms. There's the gate. So there's no actual industry evidence there. This is purely an administrative town. It's for official functionaries. It's for tax collectors and military commanders. But the regular folks must have lived on the outskirts outside the fortified town, down, down below. And, and there are a lot of smaller towns in the vicinity that have been discovered. So it is very much like the iron to be um, site of Megiddo, which is almost exclusively administrative. Very little in the way of residential. Here there is, is residential, but the people who are living here must be officials. And it is remarkable how much smaller this place is than any of the uh, fortified cities of the northern kingdom. In the 
um, one of the walls of one of the storerooms were found these very peculiarly shaped, very nicely formed blocks. These blocks had been built into a storeroom wall. But when all the blocks that looked like that were removed and put together, they could make this 1.6 meter square horned altar. And the, upon the discovery of this, there was and remains a major disagreement. There's just about nothing in this. <laughs> this is just one argument after another. The archaeology of Israel. I warn you, I warn you. And if you find any websites and you want to use any websites that I have not approved for you to use, um, and you're thinking about, because you're, you're finding it hard to get through Larry Herr's detailed descriptions of things in your course pack, you think I'm going to make my life easier and find some information on the web, please check with me before you start to repeat anything in your papers because the chances of going wrong are high. All right, so there's a big fight about where this thing was, where this horned altar was. And uh, the excavator of the site, Yohanan Aharoni, um, for various reasons, thinks that this building up here um, was a temple and uh, the detailed archaeological explanation for this, I am not going to go into here. Um, in, in part because we don't have time, and in part because I, I don't agree with him. I agree with the, with the other person who hypothesized about this altar. Um, but, but suffice it to say, and for anybody that wants more reading, I can give you more reading about this. He thinks it was, it was up here. Um, and uh, his, his uh, chief archaeological rival, Yigal Yadin, the two of them spent their entire lives Yudin at Hebrew University, Aharoni at Tel Aviv, arguing with each other about absolutely everything. So Yadin, for example, says that the pillared rooms at Beersheba were stables because the ones at Megiddo were stables, even though these were found filled with pots. <laughs> um, so the, oh, the two of them were just ridiculous. Anyway, but Yadin did write a very good article, which I, can, I also, um, I haven't put it on the website yet, but I will called Beersheba, the high place destroyed by King Josiah, um, that says that uh, the altar was actually originally here in this building, which is right on the inside of the city gate when you walk in. And when you walk in, this is how this area was discovered by uh, Aharoni's expedition. There's a staircase here, a little staircase, that makes a right angle, but there's nothing there. There's nothing for the staircase to go to. And uh, Yadin says that the altar would fit perfectly right there inside the staircase and then would be a high place immediately to the left of the gate when you walked in. And this is the text that he adduces in support of that. Josiah commanded, he'll, this is another one of these ritual cleansing operations. Josiah commanded Hilkiah the priest to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, for Asherah. For the host of heaven, he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron. Did away with idolatrous priests, whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense, in the high places in the cities of Judah. Also those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, and to the moon. So you see those um, behaviors of the Israelites that Liz Blocksmith talked about in her article still apparently making problems for the kings of Judah. Then he defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba, and he broke down the high places which were at the entrance on one's left at the city gate. This is an awfully peculiar passage because it's so specific. Usually these discussions, and there are repeated discussions of how the kings of Judah had to again and again and again talk some sense into the people and get rid of the idols and the high places and the idolatrous priests and the Asherah poles and the this and the that. Um, but usually these are rather large general statements. Um, this is, I think, the only example in the Hebrew Bible about one of these cleansing operations by one of the kings of Judah with this peculiarly specific statement. Um, he broke down the high places which were at the entrance on one's left of the city gate. And if you look again at the plan, that's exactly where this is. I and mean, it's sort of uncanny. 
So uh, that's why I agree, actually, in this case with Yadin, that this stairway that goes nowhere in this building um, must have originally been what the, what the horned altar uh, was, was for. And the implications are large for a reconstruction of religious practice in Judah at this time because a high place or an altar where on which you burn incense is very different from a temple. A temple replaces another building. A high place is, 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 is a different sort of thing. And I'm not even a high place, an altar. An altar on the way into another, uh, into another structure. And you see that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that, that Aharoni and his crew didn't agree with this is because this is not a very impressive or important building. Building 443, as it's known, um, is actually, it looks like it was partially some sort of a stable or a storeroom. Um, Yadin here has reconstructed it as a stable because he thinks all the pillared buildings are stables. So that's why he has horses and donkeys in the manger. But um, the Tel Aviv people would reconstruct this as a storeroom. But whatever it is, it's not a very impressive and official building. And yet, this looks like to be the most logical spot for, uh, for the altar fragments. Did they find any fauna remains in this building here? No. Nope. No, but they weren't looking for fauna remains. This was the 19, early 1970s. And I can tell you for sure, because this was my very first excavation, 1973, Beersheba. I mean, the altar was sitting out in front of the, 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 the dining room. <laughs> they hadn't moved it to the Israel Museum yet. That would make sense. I mean, a stable or a place to keep stuff. Yes. One, it would have been a wonderful thing to test for, but nobody was testing for stuff like that then. So, yes. The, but the fragments uh, from the top of the altar do have burning on them. So it's, it wasn't something that was strictly ceremonial. It was used. It was. So it was dismantled and built into one of the storeroom walls. So there had been some reconstruction and um, then construction of it. So what does that construction do when it was built? Well, we don't know. We, in part, the date depends on when you think the altar was dismantled. That is, there's not, in part, the date depends on what historical circumstance you associate with the, the event. Because archaeologically, we can't demonstrate when the wall was built. No, no, it's not. It's, um, it's, it's one of these. Okay, so uh, next time, next time we are going to um, greet the Assyrians who are going to finally make their way further south to Judah and then see what Assyrian hegemony over both Judah and Philistia brings and maybe even destroy it all. <laughs>